Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening. When science fiction author Isaac Asimov imagined a world of robots living among us, he wrote, machines will do the work that makes life possible and humans will do the things that make life pleasant. And while Asimov's vision has only played out in Hollywood so far, many of the most prominent roboticists believe that in fact, it's not that far off. Today, engineers and ethicists are readying themselves for what's been dubbed the robot revolution, a sea change so life-altering some say it will make the internet look like a little blip. It's a prediction that might sound like hyperbole to most. That is until you see it for yourself. In the Danish city of Aalborg, where the history traces back to the time of Renaissance and the dawn of the new world, some see another era on the horizon. We are no more than a decade away from having full-fledged androids moving about in our society. Professor Henrik Scherfi, one of only a handful of people in the world who has an exact replica of himself. Welcome to the Gemini lab. Thank you. Oh my goodness. This is my flexible friend. Wow. Yeah, room temperature, I know. What is it like to be a man with two bodies? It's fun. <laughs> His doppelganger is an android called DK, a robot he had built so he could study the relationship between man and machine. When you have an android close to, uh, it becomes much easier because you can see now, whoa, this could actually be my reality in just a couple of years. You can have someone like this walking around the house doing this, doing that. A lot of people will be scared by that notion. Yeah. This is my winter color and now it's summer. Uh, so the android doesn't change color. No tanning. <laughs> no tanning. The similarity is striking, if not a bit mind-boggling. Wow, down to the shoes. The same build, the same burn mark on the left hand, even the same salt and pepper hair. Some of it is mine. Some of the hair is actually yours? Yeah, just a little. DK is not autonomous. It can simulate breathing and blinking and a few basic movements, but it can't walk or talk on its own. It was built over the course of nine months by a team in Japan led by Hiroshi Ishiguru, a roboticist renowned for creating androids of incredible human likeness. The first android was Ishiguru's own back in 2005. Then came a female version and most recently DK. Together, the trio is known as the Geminoid Project. This is like a crazy tea party. <laughs> <laughs> and while to many this may seem like nothing more than a creepy science experiment, Sherfi says there is a purpose, an important one behind it all. Understanding before robots arrive, how we interact with them, what they should look like, and what the boundaries should be. We are learning that it's much more complicated than we thought. We've been focusing very much on how to make communication work between humans and androids. The situation DK is placed in most often is in Sherfi's observation lab at the University of Aalborg. Oh, so you're watching me through that camera. And that camera. Oh yeah, but you didn't notice when you came in here, did you? No. No, and people tend to forget about it. Sherfi acts as the robot's voice and takes participants through a test. Hi. The goal is to assess how people engage with the robot, answering its questions, and in this case, making eye contact. They were seeking the acceptance of the android, uh, which is normal at that stage because they've been with him for a while. They don't just see him as a machine. So the longer they were in the room, the more they came to accept him as a, a being in the room. Sure, and the uncanniness completely disappears. When you're looking at this device, are you thinking human or machine? Somewhere in between, I think. <laughs> it, like, it looks like a human, but when you talk to it, yeah, you realize it isn't. <laughs> It 
It's when DK is brought out into the public that the reactions are the most dramatic. Like this woman, who can't believe that what she's looking at isn't real. Prøv at mærke her først, så kan du mærke forskellen. Så prøv at mærke der. What was that woman saying to you when she was so reluctant to touch the hand? Yeah, she was convinced there was a person. This is a sewer bot. And she said, how can I know? You can touch it. Then you have to break your own expectations, right? It's this sort of response that Cherfi will then interpret for his research, providing some of the first ever guidelines for human robot interaction. We have no good theory, no good strategy when we try to figure out which robot should go where. So, what kind of interface would you have on which Android or which robot? And so this information would come into play because companies would want to know what sort of robot they should design for what purpose? Certainly. And companies are already designing them, robots in the shape of people called humanoids. Toyota has a fleet prized for its agility and speed. Honda has what many consider the gold standard in humanoid robots called ASIMO, rumored to be worth a million dollars, but not yet for sale. And many other companies are entering the race too, creating and selling robots in the human shape. The emerging market that many forecast will drive the demand is our aging population. So the problem is who will help those persons? We cannot afford to have a nanny near every old person. So you're saying we're going to have humanoid robots in the house to keep people at home longer as they're aging? Yes. Emile Petriou is the director of the School of Engineering at the University of Ottawa. So welcome to my lab. He and his grad students are taking a metal frame and building it into what they believe will be a commercialized personal healthcare robot. Isn't there a concern that these elderly people will create emotional bonds with the robots? Oh, definitely they will create. Isn't that a bad thing? Matter of discussion. Who's making the rules right now when it comes to robots and our interaction with them? The people who are building the robots are making the rules. Ian Kerr is a robo-ethicist, also at the University of Ottawa, who teaches a course on the law of robotics. I think the important thing that I try to work with my students on understanding is why the humanoid? Why are we going after the humanoid robot? Why are we? Because we want people to trust the machine systems and interact with them as though they're interacting with their friends, loved ones and acquaintances. How dangerous is that? Well, I think it can be very dangerous if we delegate what was once really important, fundamental, foundational human relationships, relationships between an elder generation and a younger generation, and all of a sudden we delegate that to machine systems. I think there are losses, uh, certainly, that one can imagine as well as the gains. But those potential gains are still fueling a race. A race to get the first mass-produced robot to market and ultimately into your home and into your workplace. We seem poised to be on, on the precipice of a robot society. Next on 16 by 9, could this little guy... I want to come with you. <laughs> ...be your next BFF? This is gross. You have a problem. I brought you something. Hi, Frank. You have got to be kidding me. Head to a theater right now, and you can watch what many roboticists say is our likely future. Frank, you need a project. Today we're going to start a garden. I'm not gardening. My program's goal is to improve your health. The movie, Robot and Frank, depicts a time when robots tend to the elderly at home. It's time for your enema. 
It's one of the scenarios French company Aldebaran is intently working toward. We see a day in not too distant future, maybe five years, where robots will be actively assisting the elderly. Eric Stevenson is the VP of sales. We're not just saying any robot in the home in five years, you're saying your robot in the home in five years. Yes, you will see a version of our robot helping in some way in the home in five years. His robot is called Now, a pint-sized humanoid with an animation-inspired face. Okay. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Now. Where do you come from, Carolyn? Canada. Oh, I've always dreamt to visit Canada. Bring me there, please. Ah. And while Now only stands 57 centimeters tall, Aldebaran is in the process of designing a version that will be nearly three times as big capable of functioning alongside people right in their homes. Helping with the meals, helping with lifting things, helping with mobility. The robot could even be a source of entertainment and companionship. I want to come with you. <laughs> OK, let's go. At present, the smaller now can walk. But tonight is coming to save the galaxy. Talk. Mind showing me your face. Recognize faces and is equipped with Wi-Fi. It functions as a programmable platform, much like your iPhone. It's the same concept with robots. You will have global communities of people that are writing programs that will make it useful in ways that I or you can't even imagine today. Already, users have turned now into a thriller dancing. In a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars reciting. demonstrates well now sense of balance. Tai Chi master. If I had a now by my bedside, could I wake up lazily in the morning and say, now, read me my email? Yes, absolutely. And, and it, it would, could. It could download your emails. It could tell you what the weather is like today. And read it to me. It'd tell it to you. Speak it to you. Yes. Price tag? Now's cost $16,000. Aldebaran has sold 2,500 nows to universities around the world, including six here in Canada. Question is, are we ready to make the leap from lab to everyday life? I think you could ask the same question back in the 70s and say, were, was society ready for a personal computer revolution and all the things that that would bring? A lot of people might have said, oh, I'm not quite sure. Same thing as now. Are we ready for a robotics revolution? I think we are. According to Professor Ian Kerr, by introducing a robot companion, we're wading into an ethical quagmire. Could it be that a child comes home after a day at school and would rather hang out in his room with his robot than his brother? Well, we already see that with, um, with, with children who play with avatars online. There was one that was retained by L Girl, the magazine uh, called L Girl Buddy. And what she was, was an avatar that little young kids could talk to online uh, in, the, in the instant message platform. In the very short time that she existed online was told something like eight million times, I love you. The robotic integration many see upon us doesn't just mean robots in the home. It also means robots at work. So this is Baxter, and the way you program Baxter is you actually grab it and hold it. The industrial robot Baxter became available for sale from Rethink Robotics, based in Boston, just this month. Why don't you put your fingers around there and just grab it? It is the brainchild of Rodney Brooks, arguably the most prominent roboticist in North America and creator of the robot vacuum Roomba, which has sold 8 million units worldwide. This is a big deal. I resigned my tenured professorship at MIT to work full time on this because I think this is the future of manufacturing. Do you think every factory or nearly every factory might have a Baxter in it? Yes, yeah, so we'll have Baxters and other robots over time. We will have more and more robots in our factories, and Baxter is the first mass-produced humanoid robot for factories. Baxter doesn't speak, but it has what Brooks calls an expressive face and can be ready for use within an hour of taking it out of the box. And at $20,000, Brooks's goal is to shift industrial robotics from large factories to small and medium ones. So for the criticism that you're going to eliminate jobs, you say? Right now, North America sends hundreds of billions of dollars to Asia to do manufacturing. 
if you bring that manufacturing back to, to North America, then there's a lot of money that's getting spent here, which is otherwise going off the continent. Brooks is so convinced this is going to take off. And this is where we built our prototypes. Rethink Robotics is undergoing a rapid expansion. This is where we're going to be filled. New employees are literally coming in by the day with rows of empty desks awaiting them. How many Baxters do you think you'll make? I'd like to think that, that ultimately we're going to make hundreds of thousands of Baxters. It is exactly as robo-ethicist Ian Kerr and others hypothesize. A robot society placing machine among man. And while companies fight to make it to market first, people like Kerr are pausing to question whether the reward justifies the risk. What are the ethical pitfalls? What are some of the legal things we should be thinking about as well? And maybe in some of those cases, we'll reflect and say, you know what, that application might be powerful, but we ought not to go there. And that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching and have a great weekend.